Okay. I guess I am live now. It says I'm live. Okay. So this live stream is going to be dedicated to finishing our analysis on the REIT watch list that we built using the stock unlock screener. So we did a live stream analyzing REITs probably a couple of weeks ago now, and it's on the stock unlock channel. So if you want to go watch the first half of this part one, then um, yeah, it's on our channel and you can go find it there. But this is going to be dedicated to finishing it. It's number two. So with that being said, I'm going to share my screen now right here. I'm going to move this over here and then we should be on the REITs and I'm going to change this to that. Okay. So this is the REITs watch list right here. And we're going to go through all of these to try and find the best one now. And the reason that I waited was because I was waiting for all of these REITs to report their third quarter results and they officially have. So now we have updated information on all of these stocks. Now, right away, I want to see which one is, has the highest insight score. Okay. So Cube has the highest insight score, then Rexer, then EXR Extra Storage, then Life Storage, then National Storage. Okay, and all of these have very high insight score. The worst one is actually Storage Vault, then Granite. Interesting. Okay. So let's get into this. The way that I'm going to compare all of these stocks is actually with our freeform tool. So I'm going to open up the freeform right here. And what I want to do is I took notes right here saying if it's an industrial or a self-storage REIT or what kind of REIT it is. So what I want to do is actually compare all of the industrial REITs against one another to try and find which one is the best. So let's do that. So right here, the first industrial REIT is Rexer. And then what's the next one? Um, FR. Add all of these to the freeform tool. Industrial TRNO. Egg. And then I believe the last one here was um, granite. Yes. Okay. So GRT dot UN. Perfect. And we're going to take a look at the revenue growth of all of these businesses. Okay. So let's look at the past decade. Which one of these five industrial REITs is growing the fastest? It looks like Rexar is right here. I'll zoom in for everyone. Rexar is growing revenue at 33% over the past decade. TRNO, 32%. Stag, 26%. GRT, 9%. And FR, 5%. So FR looks like it is the REIT growing at the slowest over the past decade. Let's take a look at the past five years. FR again, only 6%. Rexer is growing the fastest by far at 34%. Stag 20%, TRNO 18 and Granite 14 So yeah, FR looks like it is the REIT growing the slowest in terms of revenue. Let's take a look at operating cash flow. Rexer the fastest by far. FR, Granite's actually growing operating cash flow the slowest. That's super interesting. FR growing at 17%, TRNO 20, STAG 20. Okay, so what I'm noticing here is the clear outlier in both revenue and cash flow growth is Rexer, like by far. Okay, that is super interesting. So then what I actually want to do is take a look at operating cash flow per share growth. So this will factor in the dilution. That these companies do because REITs like to dilute a lot. So when we take a look at operating cash flow per share, Rexer number one again, TRNO number two, um, then FR, then Granite, then Stag. Okay, what about the past five years? Rexer and FR the fastest, Granite the slowest, Stag the second slowest, and TRNO. Okay, so in all metrics, basically Rexer is growing the fastest, and then it is basically. And then I would say it's TRNO so far that looked like the most solid. These are the two companies actually generating the most operating cash flow per share, it looks like. So that's interesting. Okay. Then the next question is, okay, well, what is the price of these businesses? So let's put the price of operating cash flow. And yeah. Okay. Let's look at the table here, actually. So Rexer as we saw, is growing the revenue the fastest by far, operating cash flow by far. 
operating cash flow for per share growing the fastest by far, but it's also trading at the highest price ratios by quite a bit. Um, 32 price to operating cash flow right now. So the market knows that this is the highest quality REIT right here, and the market's paying for that. FR has the lowest price ratios. Well, actually, Stag has the lowest price ratios. FR has the second lowest price ratios. It's hardly growing revenue, which makes sense why its price ratios are lower. Um, what's interesting down here, though, is that Stag had the same growth rates as Granite, but Granite is quite a bit more expensive, like 20% more expensive. So Stag actually looks like it's selling at a discount relative to its growth than Granite. Also, Stag is selling at the same price ratio, almost the exact same price ratio as FR. And as we saw, FR was one of the companies that's growing the slowest. So that's also interesting. TRNO is also selling near the same price ratios as Rexer, despite Rexer being a much a REIT that's growing much more quickly, in my opinion. So I think this one's expensive relative to its growth, because basically for the same price, you could get Rexer, which historically has grown much more rapidly. So TRNO, I think, is going to be deleted. Yes, I'm sure. I also think Granite has to be deleted because Stag is growing basically the same and selling at a 20% discount. So no, we're going to keep Stag. I want to delete Granite. Also, Granite has those lower insight scores, which is super interesting. Okay, so we're going to get rid of GRT. We're going to get rid of TRNO. And then we have FR and Stag and Rexer. So Stag and FR are basically trading at the exact same price ratios, right? And we saw that Stag is growing better. So basically Stag right now is just selling at a discount to this one, and that one's not growing as quickly. So we're also going to delete FR. So basically what I'm seeing from all of this Stag looks decent, to be honest. I don't love the price ratio on Rexer, but it's growing just so dang quickly. So honestly, I think Rexer is the highest quality industrial REIT out there. It's just too expensive for me right now. And then Stag looks like it's a high quality REIT selling at a decent valuation, in my opinion. So yeah, that's kind of my thoughts on these so far. And um, yeah, I'll actually put those in the notes here. Yeah, even in my initial notes, I said price to FFO of 15 and not bad. Seems one of the best industrial REITs and selling at a fair price right now. And then Rexer is the highest quality industrial REIT, honestly. It's really impressive what this company has done. Even though it's expensive, in my notes, I even put expensive, that makes sense. High quality. But too dang expensive, man. It is the best industrial REIT, though. All right. So yeah, Exer and Stag, basically. All right, now we're going to go back to the freeform tool. And what I want to do is take a look at the self storage REITs now, which are Cube. EXR is another self storage REIT. We don't have a lot of historical data on Cube. Man, that's too bad. That's really unfortunate. Okay. It's really unfortunate. That's the highest rated stock, man. Dang. Okay. EXR, LSI, NSA. So also what I've noticed, the self-storage facilities, like these self-storage REITs grow so freaking quick. It's insane. Okay, then SVI. SVI has a low insight score. I've taken a look at that one. This one is super expensive, actually, so I'm just going to delete that. All right, so these are the three we're going to take a look at then. XR, LSI, and NSA. First off, let's take a look at how much they're growing their revenue. Over the past, looks like NSA became public in 2015, 2014-ish. So let's take a look at 20, uh, 2015, past seven years. So EXR is growing revenue at 16%, LSI 16%-ish. 
NSA 35%. So NSA is clearly the company growing its revenue the fastest over the past seven years. Over the past five years, same story, 28% revenue growth. Wow. This thing's growing really fast. What about the past three years? 30% compounded annual revenue growth compared to EXR. EXR is consistently the company that is growing the slowest as well in terms of revenue. Take a look at operating cash flow. Holy smokes, man. What? NSA has compounded their operating cash flow at 63% a year. LSI 20%, EXR 19%. So EXR is the one growing the slowest still. Over the past five year, NSA, the fastest growth, same story, one, two, three. Over the past three years, one, two, three. Okay, so EXR is consistently growing the slowest, LSI second, NSA fastest. What about operating cash flow per share? Is this the same story? It is not the same story. So NSA, they're getting that large operating cash flow net growth but it's happening from dilution. So when you factor in the dilution, their operating cash flow per share is actually not growing the fastest. L LSI is growing the fastest when you factor in the dilution. That is super, super interesting. Let's go back to 2014 or about 2015. Actually, let's go to about 2019. So yeah, really over the past three years, because NSA has diluted so much, from 2019 to 2022, they're actually growing operating cash flow per share the slowest, even though the operating cash flow net has grown the fastest. That's super interesting. So LSI is killing it. LSI is absolutely killing it. So the LSI seems to be the business that's actually creating the most shareholder value. So what is the price to operating cash flow of these businesses? Uh, zoom in here. So NSA, that's super interesting. So the market knows that NSA is doing a lot of dilution because they've historically priced the stock very low and they're factoring in the dilution that the company's doing. So that's really interesting. LSI is cheaper than EXR right now though. And it looks like it's historically been cheaper too. So EXR is growing revenue much slower than LSI. It's growing operating cash flow slower. And it's growing operating cash flow per share slower, yet it's trading at a premium to LSI. That's actually quite interesting. LSI is cheaper and it's growing faster. So immediately I'm thinking LSI looks like it could be selling at a, at a much more attractive price ratio than EXR because you're getting more growth essentially for a cheaper price. And then NSA, you know, it does dilute quite a bit, but man, that's a pretty attractive price ratio for NSA, 11.3. What's its average? 11.81. Yeah, I would still say LSI is like the highest quality self-storage REIT right here, in my opinion. Um, just because it's growing the fastest and it's creating the most shareholder value through operating cash flow per share, and it's selling cheaper than EXR. So EXR has got to go. Great stock, honestly, though. Like, not a bad stock at all, in my opinion. Just LSI's slightly better and slightly cheaper then nsa is interesting uh, i don't know like it's just so freaking cheap man 11. <sighs> here this is what i'll do i'll leave nsa and i'll say this stock really likes to dilute which is causing the operating cash flow per share to grow slower. The price seems to be reflecting that operating cash flow. I'll leave it. But then LSI, this is Oops. Seems to be the fastest growing self storage REIT and trades at a slight discount to the XR. But yeah. LSI, in my opinion, looks like it's pretty good. It's also got a very good insight score here, 4.32. It's really good. 
that's pretty dang good. And then NSAs, 4.22, that's also pretty dang good. But this company just dilutes quite a bit more, like a lot more actually. So that's super interesting. Okay, so I wish we could do Q. I got to talk to the guys about this one because we should have data on this and like this stock is up massively. So I got to talk to the guys about why we don't have the data on that stock. Okay, next up we have done self storage. We have done industrials. Okay, ELS is a weird one because this this company like buys and rents out and sells motorhomes, I think. Let me take a look. Look at that growth though. Holy smokes, man, compared to the spy. Like, holy smokes, dude. It's up 900%. I mean, when you include dividends, it's got to be up even more. Yeah, so this thing is up over the past decade. Including dividends, it's produced 1,200% returns versus the SPY's 170%. That's insane. Really, really great stock historically, at least. But um, what do they do? Ownership, operation, lifestyle-oriented properties consisting primarily of manufactured homes and recreational vehicle communities. So, like, it's it's a weird REIT. It's really hard to, like, compare this one to other REITs because it's just such a weird REIT. <laughs> But anyways, we're going to throw it in the freeform tool. Why not? ELS, let's go. And let's add in, let's add in ADC. We're also going to add in Pine. I think these are the REITs that we have left. Yeah, ELS, Pine, and ADC. Those are the ones we got to take a look at. So let's just do all those at once. Okay, so I don't want to know the price to operating cash flow yet. I want to know the revenue growth. And I want to know which one's this pine looks like it became public in 2019. Really? Okay. Well, ADC is growing revenue quick. Pine's growing revenue quick. Let's take a look at ELS versus ADC really quick because they've been around for years. So over the past 20 years, ELS has grown revenue at 10%, ADC at 16%. Wow, ADC is actually like compounding quite a bit. If we take a look at operating cash flow, ELS 11%, ADC 17%. Wow, what about operating cash flow per share? Okay, there we go. So ADC has grown its operating cash flow per share by only 1.43% a year over the past 20 years. So this company to grow its cash flow has been diluting a lot, a lot. ELS has done 7.74, which is much better. If we go to the past 10 years, ELS 11.8%. So they must be actually buying back shares, um, ADC 7%. So ELS still outperforming. Over the past five years though, ADC has really started getting it together, it looks like. And they've been growing operating cash flow per share at 12% versus EOS's 10%. And over the past three years, it's actually outperforming EOS as well. Pine has grown the fastest, it looks like, though. Interesting. Okay. Over the past couple of years. So what's the price for these? Okay, interesting. So ADC... Well, historically, ADC has been priced higher than ELS, which makes no sense to me because ELS was growing faster and ADC was diluting its shareholders massively. So, yeah, I don't get that. Like, historically, I think ELS was a better investment, personally, until recently, maybe. Really weird what the market does sometimes. Anyways. Um, ADC priced operating cash flow, ELS has the highest, ADC is second, and then Pine is only at 10. Wow. Interesting. Really weird. What are the what is the revenue of this business doing? Revenue is still growing. The most recent quarter was a record. Like, look at that revenue growth. That's insane. That is insane. Operating cash flow. 
looks kind of cyclical, but in the trailing 12 months, record high. What is it growing at yearly? Grew 27% year over year. That is crazy. This looks like a decent business, honestly. Like, holy smokes, this looks really decent. This is definitely one I would take a look at more. That is really decent. Okay. Um, ADC, let's go and take a look at ADC now. Financials, revenue, quarterly. Well, that's weird. That's not right. Okay. In the trailing 12 months, operating cash flow has really started spiking up. Holy smokes, man. That's really good as well. What have the dividends been doing? This is really hard. These are both pretty solid stocks, it looks like. Dividends grown at 6% a year. What is EOS dividends? EOS is growing the dividend more. Dividend yield is that. ADC has a higher dividend yield. Honestly, ELS to me looks like a dividend growth stock, like a massive dividend growth stock. Its FFO yield is also 5.3%, which is not bad for how quick it's growing. Like this is honestly not bad at all. I'm gonna have to keep both of these on the list, I think. Both of these look pretty freaking solid, man. Okay, that looks like a pine. Okay. Um, financials. So this stock, since it became public, really hasn't done anything. Like the share price is actually down from when it became public. It's got a 6% dividend. So what is happening with this stock? Like what is going on here? Revenue is growing, but in the most recent quarter, it only grew by 2%. Okay. Is operating cash flow growing? Operating cash flow kind of looks like it's been topping out. So this one doesn't really look like it's that much of a growth stock. It looks like it's kind of just like a pretty big dividend payer, but dividends of 6% are the dividends growing. Um, yeah, they are. I don't know. I don't think this is like a super growth investment. I'm going to remove this one ADC and, um, ADC and ELS looks solid though. Okay, so this is the list right here. These are the ones left. These look like some really, really, really high quality REITs right here based on everything we just ran through. So that is the list. Um, I will share this list again with everyone. And I'll put it in the chat here. And yeah, this is a very, very solid list of REITs. They got really high insight scores, nice dividend paying companies growing, absolutely destroying the S&P 500. All of these REITs are destroying the S&P 500 historically. And um, yeah, got some self-storage REITs, got a retail REIT right here, uh, manufactured REIT. This one's super interesting. I'm going to take a look at this one on my own, like dive into the business more. And yeah, those REITs look pretty freaking solid, man. Like really solid, honestly. So that is the REIT watch list, everyone. What is going on in the chat? I have not looked at the chat once here. Um, okay, so we have some comments about other REITs or other stocks, I guess. Can you analyze tree? I don't know if this is a REIT, but I can take a look. Blending tree, financial services. It's got a bad insight score and it looks like it's down a lot. Holy smokes, dude. What happened? This thing has lost 95 ish percent of its value over the past year. Its revenue is going down. It's got a bad insight score. Operating margin negative, high gross margin, but okay, what? High gross margin, negative operating margin. How? What is happening there? What are their operating expenses? Free cash flow margin, 5%. What's happening? Revenue decreasing, gross profit decreasing, operating income decreasing, net income decreasing, operating cash flow decreasing, free cash flow increasing. What? Weird. Book value decreasing, tangible book value decreasing. 
financial health looks decent. Debt to EBITDA ratio is very high. Lots of intangibles. Tangible book value negative. What is going on with this business, man? What is happening here? What the frick? I don't like this stock. <laughs> this is just, I have so many questions going on in my head right now. Like, what is happening? I don't know. I like right away, personally, I don't think I would own this one. Like, I don't understand what's happening to the revenue. It looks like last time during the recession, this stock lost like 80% of its revenue. So it looks like it doesn't handle recessions very well. Um, the cash flow is all over the freaking place. I don't see how there's any predictability right here. So I don't know. I don't like this one. Um, <laughs> that's a wild drop, man. 95% of the value loss. You know, like there are so many high quality businesses in the stock market that I don't know. I, I wouldn't, I personally would not like this one. I wouldn't own it personally. Um, okay. So this question comes from Patrick Boyer and I'm looking at my other screen because it's just better for the live stream if I have it on the second screen and Patrick asks, Hey D, awesome random re review part two. Thank you. I just started this up. With NSA, are the assets growing with the dilution? So I got to refresh this page. But when we took a look at NSA, basically the reason that it wasn't growing as fast as LSI was because NSA is doing a ridiculous amount of dilution. Let's go and take a look, actually. Like if we go to the financials here, and we go to their diluted shares outstanding. Like what is happening with these diluted shares outstanding? They are all over the freaking place. Anyways, they've doubled their share count basically from 2014 to 2022. And like these random share count spikes right here are probably because on their SEC filings, they just like accounted for certain shares in certain quarters or whatever. But yeah, they've doubled their share count over the past like eight years. And that's heavily, heavily affected the uh, operating cash flow per share, which we need to get in stock and lock, by the way, on this tab right here. That's something we got to add. Anyways, when you go to the free form tool, you can see that their operating cash flow per share is not growing nearly as quick as the actual operating cash flow because of how much dilution the company's doing. We go to operating cash flow per share versus just the operating cash flow growth. You can see operating cash flow per share is growing at like half the rate as the net operating cash flow, just because of how much they're diluting. So, yeah, that's the reason why I think LSI was a little bit better, just because NSA is doing so much dilution. Could I look over? Um, this person asks, Daniel, where do I see your read list? I think I just put it in the comments right here. I'll paste it again. But yeah, you can see it on stock unlock via the link. All right. Um, what is my thesis for owning Dream Industrial from Corey Wells? So Dream Industrial is another industrial REIT. And I think that the company is just... Well, one, it's in Canadian currency. So I don't like to, you know, hold too much US dollars since I'm a Canadian. I like to have my currency in Canadian. So basically, I was looking at Granite Real Estate versus Dream Industrial. And Dream Industrial is growing their operating cash flow and FFO per share at a faster rate than Granite. And they're selling at a cheaper price. And they're also trading for like 0. 0.6 times book value right now. So they're trading 40% below book value. I don't think that they're like a super growth investment. But they pay a 6% dividend. The dividend is not going to grow, by the way. Um, the management is not focused on growing the dividend. But it's a 6% dividend now, 40% um, below book value. They're growing their operating cash flow per share very nicely. And they have a long runway for future growth. And I think that it's just really well managed. So I think that it's just like a super value investment. Um, that's basically the thesis. Is It's just like so freaking cheap that I wanted to own some. It's a lot cheaper than granite, in my opinion. And um, it's growing faster also. So that's why I own some 
some dream industrial. Um, have I ever looked into NLCP? It's a cannabis REIT. Yes, I have. And the reason I do not like cannabis REITs is because cannabis companies are highly unprofitable and it's not, you got to think about this. All right. We've been, we've, I've been asked a lot about IIPR as well. So what these companies do is they rent out real estate to cannabis companies, essentially, but cannabis companies are almost all unprofitable. They're all losing money. So you got to think about this. The tenants of businesses like NLCP, IIPR, and another company, PW, they're all unprofitable tenants. So how long is that rental income come, going to come in? And how high of a risk is that? Because IIPR, for example, this was a $286 stock last year. It fell 68% over the past year because they were having some drama with their tenants. PW is another stock where they were renting out real estate to cannabis companies. And you know, take a look at this. Everything was going great for the stock, right? I mean, it was $6 a share in 2019. And then by 2021, they were up 1,084%. So the stock 11 x in two years, right? Everything looked like it was going great. They were renting out their real estate to cannabis companies. Awesome. And then their tenants started defaulting, you know, because they're unprofitable companies that are renting out this real estate. And now the stock is down 92%. And that is a vicious, vicious, vicious sell-off, man. That is like, that is like a 90% drop within a year. Man, that is brutal. And this is what I mean. It's because their tenants started going bad and they're actually pivoting their business model now because um, they can't rely just on cannabis companies. And you can see the revenue is like, well, it's actually starting to come back, but it dropped quite a bit because one of their tenants went under. And then the revenue just stopped, right? So I think that they're high risk because of that reason. So personally, I don't want to own any of these. I don't want to own NCLP. I don't want to own IIPR or NLCP. Because they could look like they're growing fast right now. But if their tenants start going under, then that's not a good thing. I mean, yeah, this company is growing quickly. They have 5x quarterly revenue in the past two years. What's cash flow doing? Cash flow is at an all time high of 32 million, 8.5% dividend, um, FFO yield of 8%. They're also paying out like all of their FFO as a dividend. So that's interesting. But yeah, I think these are super risky stocks personally. And uh, I just won't own any of them. I think there's just too much risk. Okay, but yeah, um, just because I love stocks, all right, what is EVLV? Evolve Holdings. Okay, IPO last year. What? This thing is down like 80%. Oh, 60, it was down like 80%. Now it's down 65%. Electrical equipment, small cap. Um, over the past month. Oh, it did really shoot up on earnings. You're right. Okay, so the market liked the earnings, I guess. The insight score is not very good though, man. What's going on here? Low gross margin? No, nope, I'm out. For me, whenever I see a gross margin that's like 5%, it's really hard for me to want to invest in that stock because they essentially make no money. Like, because you got your gross profit, right? Let's take a look. We go to the financials. We have our revenue right here. In the trailing 12 months, $41 million of revenue, but it cost them $39 million to deliver their products and services just to generate that revenue. So then their gross profit is $2 million right here. And then with this $2 million of gross profit, they have to pay their operating expenses. They have to pay their salaries, research and development, marketing expenses, every single operating expense, their taxes, their, their um, interest on their debt. They have to do all of that with this tiny, tiny, tiny gross profit right here. And you can see their operating expenses were $98 million in the past year. So they cannot produce their products at a high enough profit because their gross profit margin is so slim that they cannot even come close to dealing with all of the other costs, which is why you're seeing, um, you know, their, their earnings are negative $56 million. 
And what else is going on here? Let's take a look at cash flow. What's cash flow doing? Yeah, so their cash from operating activities is negative $17 million a quarter. In the trailing 12 months, negative $100 million. Wow. And then their free cash flow was negative $106 million. So they're burning cash big time. And if we take a look, that's exactly what's happening. If you take a look at the total cash position right here, the cash is going down every single quarter because the company's unprofitable and they have no profit margins. That's not a good thing. That's a very risky position to be in because you got to ask yourself, what happens when this cash goes to zero? What are they going to do? Probably take on debt or dilute their shareholders because they're going to run out of cash. Eventually, if they're burning, you know, $20 million a quarter, our insights will tell us they probably have a cash runway of like 10 quarters, like 30 months, maybe 24 months. Boom. Okay. So our cash runway insight right here says that the company has about two years left of cash. Um, but with a 5% gross margin, man, dang, I don't know. I don't know if they're going to be able to become profitable in the next two years. They're going to have to expand these margins fast and a lot to become profitable before they run out of cash. So I think this is a risky stock. Stock. I think it's speculative. I think this is a very speculative stock. I don't like stocks that are losing money, personally. I, I try to avoid them. Okay, MFC, is this a good stock? Full disclosure, I actually own some MFC. This is an insurance company in Canada. And what you also have to know about MFC is this business is the goal of the management of this business is to have 50% of the business's profits come from Asia, the Asia Pacific region. So this company is has business in Hong Kong, they have business in Thailand, Vietnam, all these different areas. So I think even in China. So if you are you know, someone who doesn't want exposure to Asia, China, that whole situation over there, like that's something you got to consider because they want 50% of their revenue and earnings to come from that region. And they're trying to expand over in that region a lot more. Personally, I'm okay with that. And um, yeah, I'm okay with that. What is going on here though? Anyways, let's take a look at the financials. So they just reported their third quarter. And we can see the revenue for this business is kind of all over the place. So first off, the way that I view Manulife is like a bond. I basically think of this stock as like a bond in my portfolio because it's got a very nice dividend. And I think the dividend is okay. And I also think that the, um, the price for this business is like very reasonable. I don't have a huge position in this one, but I just really like the dividend income. They're also buying back shares with the additional earnings that the company has, which I like to see. But if we take a look at the price to earnings ratio of this business, like it's all the way down to six. When the stock market crashed in 2020, it was like 5.3. It was like 4.7 before their most recent earnings. But I think net income came down. And um, yeah, I just think that like, it's like, it's like dream industrial for me. It's like an income stock. I like to have it in my TFSA because it's a very high dividend yielding company. I think it's not going to stop paying the dividend. And I think that this company is going to grow over the long term. And personally, I am bullish on Southeast Asia in specific. And Manulife is expanding over there hard. I believe that they're one of the like preferred insurance providers over in Vietnam. And Vietnam has one of the fastest growing economies in the world. So... I like that MFC, Manulife, is focused on the Asia Pacific region. I like that they're expanding over there, and I'm actually bullish on that. So I think this company does have a lot of long-term tailwinds behind it. And I do think that they're making the right move, honestly. I think in the long term, it will play out, and I think it will be the right move on the company. So I like the I like the price. I like the dividend. I like the income. I like the stability of it, and I like where they're headed. I don't have a huge position, though, and I do own it, full disclosure. I do own this one. All right, so let's take a look at HD versus Lowe's, and then I got to hop off, guys. This was a random live stream that we're doing today, but uh, yeah, I got to go make dinner. <laughs> so we'll do HD versus Lowe's. So 
Insight score 3.33. Cool, 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 cool. I actually don't know the taker for lows. I'm going to assume it's just that, yeah. All right, so right away, Lowe's has a better Insight score. Looks like it has more varied goods. And yeah, Insight score is slightly better. All right, let's take a look. Dividends. So Lowe's, Lowe's is on the right, right? Yep, yeah, okay. Lowe's has a dividend score of 4.83, much higher than Home Depot, 3.67. Looks like the dividend yield is above its average right now. Dividend per share is increasing at 36%. Five-year compounded annual growth rate of 25% to the dividend, and the payout ratio is much lower than Home Depot. Both of these stocks, honestly, though, like they're growing the dividends quite nicely. Lowe's is growing the dividend more and has lower payout ratios. So the dividend, I think, is a little bit more stable over at Lowe's. And that would be why the dividend score is better and it's growing faster. Now, in terms of profitability, gross margin is almost the exact same, 33%. Operating margin is higher at um, Home Depot. Net margin's higher. Free cash flow margin higher over here. So profitability is kind of the same. Um, Lowe's has a higher cash conversion, though. So more of the net income is actual cash flow, which I like to see personally because I like cash flow. All right, growth, 2.3 versus 3.13. So Home Depot is growing revenue more. They're growing gross profit more. Operating income better over here. Net income better over here. Operating cash flow much better. Free cash flow much better. And both of their book value is decreasing. Whoa. Interesting. Okay. I really don't know what to make of these numbers. These are really interesting numbers right here. Current ratio is about the same intangibles, low intangibles. Whoa. Lowe's has bought back 9% of their shares over the past year. What? Okay. We got to do some looking here. What is happening? Wow. That's some nice revenue growth. Okay. But one thing here is that Home Depot's revenue in the great recession, it looks like they had a hard time. The revenue dropped looks like about 20 to 25% during the Great Recession. So it looks like this company does not really handle recessions well. That would also make sense though, you know, because the Great Recession was like a housing bubble burst. So maybe there wasn't a lot of new development, a lot of renovations going on. So Home Depot did not see that revenue growth. Um, I would definitely consider that, especially if we headed into an economic downturn. It also looks like their operating cash flow dropped during the Great Recession as well. Bottomed out here in 2010, 4.5 billion. And the free cash flow, what did that do? Free cash flow is kind of just stagnant. But what you can see right here, if we zoom in, what you can see right here is Home Depot buys back a lot more shares than they pay dividends. They paid $7.3 billion out in dividends, but they bought back $11.5 billion worth of shares. So they bought, in total, they returned about $19 billion to shareholders over the past year, which is more than the free cash flow. And it's more than the cash from operating activities. Okay, so this is actually really interesting. So you can see right here, think about this. So. The company brought in $13.8 billion in operating cash flow, right? That's how much they brought in in the past year in actual cash flow from operations. But then, let's pull the calculator, $13.8 billion in operating cash flow. And then they paid out $7.3 billion in dividends. So let's subtract $7.3. Let's do $7.4. Oh my goodness. I wish I could work a calculator. All right. So they had $6.4 billion left after paying dividends. All right. So then how did they repurchase $11.5 billion of stock? Those numbers don't add up. And the answer is they took out debt right here. They took out $5 billion of debt. So if we add on 5 billion here, then we have 11.4, which is surprisingly right around the amount that they bought back. So Home Depot is taking on debt to buy back shares. That is what this cash flow statement is saying. Oops. Well, that's definitely something to note. Um, yeah, I would definitely look into that.
That's what they're doing. That's just what the numbers say. That's what they're doing. And their liabilities are increasing because they're taking on more debt to do that. What are assets doing? Assets are also increasing, though. What is uh, the tangible book value doing? Well, the tangible book value went negative. Interesting. What is the book value doing? The book value is almost nothing. So, yeah, you know, you got to consider that. When you're looking at these businesses, especially with rising interest rates right now, like this company is taking on debt to buy back more shares. And it's also got a price to free cash flow of 30. I wouldn't be doing that right now. I don't like that. If the price to free cash flow was like 10, you're getting a 10% yield on your buybacks. That's better. But when you got a 3% yield on your buybacks, I don't like that. Okay, Lowe's has a much lower price to free cash flow. Ha! Lower price to free cash flow. 17.7. It looks like they had good earnings, or at least the market thought so, because they're up like 17% over the past month. Um, Year to date, they're down quite a bit, though, 20%. Since the Great Recession, though, the stock is up a lot. It's up like 1,000%, looks like. So lower dividends, 2% dividend, free cash flow yield 5.63%. Let's take a look at the financials. So my main question right away is like, how did this company's revenue hold up when um, the Great Recession happened? It held up better. It held up better. You can see like there was a slight, slight dip here. But during the Great Recession, unlike Home Depot, Lowe's held up fine. Like their business was stable. Whereas um, Home Depot had that like pretty big revenue drop. So, so far, in my opinion, at least, it looks like Lowe's is better at withstanding, well, it withstood the Great Recession a lot better. The cash flows were mostly stable, but let's see. Okay, so in 2006, about $5 billion in operating cash flow. By 2009, that dropped to about $4 billion. By 2010, 3 billion. Okay, so their, their cash flows did drop, but holy smokes, man, look at that. What is their cash flow margin? Oh, it's been stable, kind of downtrending. Okay. Oops, cash flow. Okay, now are they doing the same thing? Yep, they're doing the same thing. So, boom, calculator time. So they have 9.2 billion in trailing 12 months operating cash flow. They spent two billion on dividends, so they have seven billion dollars left. So how did they buy back fifteen billion dollars worth of shares? If we minus fifteen, negative eight, they took on four point six billion dollars of debt. Three point four. Did they lose money? They did. So the company, as we can see, nine point two billion dollars in operating cash flow. They spent two billion on dividends, then 14 billion, 15 billion on buybacks. Then they took out about 4.6 billion in debt. And the net change in cash rate here from all of that is negative three billion dollars, which we also saw right here, about 3.4. So yeah, this company is also taking on debt to supplement its buybacks, but it's also buying back more shares than I mean it lost three billion dollars, right? From buying back shares. But let's see, what's the balance sheet like? Yeah, so they only have 1.4 billion left in cash. And a lot of that just went from, they're like their cash quarter over quarter dropped, mostly just from buying back shares, man. That's what happened. Liabilities growing, but assets are probably growing. No, not really. Okay, so liabilities are growing faster than assets, which would mean book value is going down. And it is. There you go. So yeah, what these companies are doing is they're taking on a lot of debt to buy back shares um, right now. They're buying back a lot of shares with debt. This one has a better yield on the shares of 5.63%, but I still don't love that. So yeah, that's my opinion on those two. I don't like it. Um, I don't think I would own these personally. That's just my opinion though. But yeah. Also looks like Lowe's might be a slightly better business, in my opinion, because Home Depot um, did not handle the Great Recession nearly as well. So if we do enter an economic slowdown, like a pretty big one, 
then at least on historical information, it looks like Lowe's handles those times better. So that would be why I would prefer Lowe's right now if I had to choose, but I wouldn't choose either. <laughs> I'd rather buy some more Google or something. You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, Google, what's Google's price to free cash flow right now? Slightly higher. Okay. Slightly higher than Lowe's, but man, in that dip right here that Google was in, you could probably get Google at the same price as Lowe's and it's Google. What? So I don't know. I, I think I'd rather buy Google personally. Anyways, <laughs> that was a long little analysis. I'm sorry on uh, HD versus Lowe's, but that's going to wrap up the live stream, everyone. It was a random live stream. We looked over REITs. We looked over some new stocks, um, but I got to go make dinner. I'm getting hungry. <laughs> so I'm going to log off now. Hope you guys enjoyed. We're going to be doing the live stream stock talk tomorrow with Jake because we're both going to be gone on Saturday. So um, sometime tomorrow afternoon, we're going to be doing the stock talk live stream, moving it up a day because again, we're going to be gone Saturday. So if you guys want to tune into stock talk tomorrow, we're going to be doing a lot more live analysis like we just did, but Jake will be here and it'll be a fun time. We always have fun. So check out the live stream tomorrow. Make sure you tune in tomorrow afternoon instead of Saturday. And that's going to wrap it up everyone. So thank you so much for tuning in. Hope you guys found some value in this. It was fun. I always love analyzing stocks live with you guys and yeah, tune in tomorrow. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'm going to go eat dinner now and I'll see you all tomorrow. Now I got to figure out how to end the live stream right here. <laughs> all right. See you guys.